We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrevix. Joining me today is James Anderson, Head of Research at SDBullion.com. How are you today, James? Good, Tom. Thanks for having me back. It's exciting to be back. Absolutely. It's, it's been a, an extremely exciting time, of course, in the, in the gold and silver space, and it's been a little while since, since you and I have spoken here. So it's great to have you back. And why don't we start by talking a little bit about what you guys have seen for demand recently. I know, you know, before we hit record here today, you were telling me a little bit about how crazy it's been. So give us some context for what kind of pickup in buying you've seen from the retail public. Sure. Uh, so obviously, I, you know, I, I'm working with SDBullion.com. SDBullion is a top three retailer in the United States. The focus is on high volume uh, investment grade, gold and silver mainly, some platinum, um, bullion, rounds, bars, coins, etc. Most of your crowd probably knows that, uh, but some of them maybe don't. Uh, but yeah, the this past month with the bank failures and the and the brittleness of the banking system becoming more exposed in terms of just in general, I think people realize if anyone investigates it, if anyone does the research, they start to see that, oh, the system's really set up fragile in a fragile way. And they're just going to pick and choose which banks are, are going to, uh, you know, that, that could potentially get bought out for, for cheap and or save if they're, you know, somewhat important. If As long as they're in that mid range, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have to be a certain size. Then it's up to the fiat decree of the U.S. Treasury and friends. To decide which live and which die, and so I think people realize, like, hey, you know, uh, I don't really feel comfortable with this bank that I'm at. Uh, you know, I'd rather I actually would feel more comfortable by buying bullion and just having it physically outside the system and just kind of wait this out, see how it goes. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what happened. I mean, you had a lot of large six figure orders come in. Uh, you know, the eighty percent of the volume. You know, it's like the eighty twenty rule, right? Eighty percent of your volume is coming for twenty percent of your customer base, right? And so when you have huge, huge inflows of currency uh, come through, you know, you, you got to have enough inventory to, to, to handle it. And then when you have a lot of orders in terms of volume of orders per, per order, you got to have a lot of hands on deck to actually fulfill that. Mm -hmm. And so it's difficult in the sense that, um, you know, you don't know when that's going to happen. Right. And so to staff and have everything all prepared and everybody trained and ready to go. Uh, when that happens, when all of a sudden your record, your all time record month, gets blown away, uh, you know, less than halfway through a month, and you end up doing more than twice the volume you've ever done before. Uh, what you end up having is a huge backlog of orders that need to be picked, packed, and parceled mm -hmm. and done done diligently. I mean, we don't just throw things in a box and ship them out the door. It has to be done with 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 some with some delicate uh, skill. So that's really what happened. I mean, essentially in the industry, we saw record demand uh, across the board for virtually anybody who's doing um, – gold and silver dealing in a uh, intelligent manner and they're not scamming their customer base. Uh, any of the high volume dealers that are that are honest, that have transparent buy sell prices essentially on their websites at all times, uh, those those dealers all saw record volume this past March. And, and you'll see the policies of orders have been raised, meaning that in order to, to order from us, I believe right now it's $500 minimum threshold uh, before it was only like a hundred bucks or something, or maybe even less. Um, so I know that people are, a little bit distraught by that if they're smaller buyers. Uh, we're going to change that policy soon. That's just a short-term thing when you have this huge demand spike. Uh, and so people just need to be patient. The reason we have to do that is because you have only so many hands on deck that are well-trained to fulfill all those orders. And by lowering, by raising the threshold, we at least can slow down the amount of orders and, and do do correctly what we've already sold. We need to fulfill those first, foremost, and, and, and kind of bite the bullet on... Uh, on trying to service everybody that we can and then getting everyone angry because we're not getting the orders out the door. Yeah, it makes sense when you when you think about it just from a, a logistical standpoint of of you know having having the staff there ready. Yeah. <laughs> and and, I mean, and 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 if you don't have that that crazy demand most of the time, then of course you're not going to have enough oh. people ready to do it. 
And then what do you have? You have a bunch of people sitting around, you know, uh, you know, you're just going to be paying them per hour to say, hey, come on and sit here and wait till the orders start flowing in. So it's this delicate balance, right. Mm-hmm. Of having staff that's diligent, that's, that's honest, that are proper, you know, people that can do the work correctly, that actually are enthused to do the work that can do it well, um, that are, that are actually committed to doing it for years uh, with our business versus someone fly by night op where it's like, who the hell knows is packing your stuff and, and who knows what's going on within that place. So uh, there's a lot of nuance obviously in the industry. And uh, we've, I can say one thing about the owner, Tyler wall. Uh, don't bet against that guy. First and foremost, he's very, 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 very shrewd and he's very competitive and he wants to make sure that we does, he does the business right. And uh, he's, he's bet down. He put a lot of bets down in terms of this industry exp- expansion that we've seen the last few years. And that's paying off. There's been a lot of things that he's done to develop the company and make it more robust. And, and so it is. Uh, but this overwhelming demand this past month was was what it was. And virtually across the industry, why? You can see that there's been an issue in terms of fulfillment of all orders. Mm-hmm. Well, on the, on the other side of that, James, we've seen record buying as well from central banks over the past 15 months. Do you have any speculation as to why China is publicly stating that they're buying gold now? Is this more of a you know, maybe a meaningful signal than just an accumulation of the metal? Yeah, I, I think we're, you know, if you look back just to, so, so we can review everyone to understand, 2022, uh, the entire year, that was the most official gold bullion volume buying since before World War II, okay? So that's, <laughs> so that's 75 years, roughly, maybe 80 years. And, and the only reason I say before World War II, it might be the all-timer, but the data I have is five-year aggregate data, and I can't break it up by year. Mm-hmm. So it, it's possible that that was the largest volume in, in the world ever for official gold buying. So uh, that was just last year. This first quarter, uh, official gold buying started off really well as well. I mean, basically, Q1 tracking versus all the data up to 2010, the last 14 years, 13 years or so, it's the most that we've seen. So. That's just to give a skew of the overall general idea of it. Most of it is going east. Most of it is going to come, you know, countries like India, China, uh, various countries throughout the Silk, the old Silk Road uh, region, uh, cu- countries that have a lot of room to grow. I think those countries are a combination of reasons why they're doing this. Uh, it's a combination of, oh, hey, we, we basically told Russia, hey, you know, those IOUs that you guys own as assets, those aren't worth anything. And everyone sees that and it's like, what? I mean, that's like crossing the threshold, right? That's that's jumping the shark, essentially. So the U.S. Treasury jumps the shark, overreacts on the Russian thing. And it just sets off a domino sequence of everyone looking around thinking, why would I own these rebukable IOUs? Let's just get the gold bullion, you know, just jump the shark. It just jump straight to the source. And so that's what's happening a lot. I think as well, we have a movement toward a uh, future CBDC and CBDC world. And in this future world, you know, when you come to the table to negotiate, you better have some official gold bullion back in yourself or, or else you're just more or less, uh, you know, subservient to other countries that you trade with, like a Canada, for instance. You know, where's your official gold? It's in your ground. OK, you go dig it up then. I mean, it's basically you're subservient to the United States and you're going to do what we say. And that's just the way it works. You're a vassal state, essentially. So countries don't want to be vassal states and they want to be sovereign. And in order to be sovereign in this world that's coming up, you better have a lot of official gold bullion. And that's essentially what's happening. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting to try to understand the, again, the nuance of the picture when we think about the the demand around the world for gold. You know, do we see a drop in demand from certain markets like India when prices are at or near all-time highs? Yeah. So there's this uh, balance that happens in the gold market where at times where the price, the spot prices are running up walls, the Easterners will look at that and they'll think, I'm not buying that. I buy the dip, man. And, you know, they like to buy the price dip. And so when that's happening, what you end up having is the Western Momo traders, all the people who, you know, institutionals and all the people who are, you know, money managers who are afraid to be fired because the last quarter didn't do so well. Mm-hmm. Those people start running into their algorithms uh, as well, all these trading algorithms they have. As soon as you have a gold breakout or a silver breakout, they'll start. You'll start seeing inflows institutionally into those, um, you know, into those markets. Gold is coming soon. Silver will be a little later uh, because the silver is just more of a beta bet on gold. So, so when you have that Western inflow because spots coming up, you have East saying, "Nah, no thanks. I like to buy when it's cheap," and vice versa. When the Westerners are the ones selling and cutting and running because the spot price went down and they're afraid of getting fired in terms of money managers. What you end up having is, okay, they sell their ETFs and the ETFs have physical bullion outflows and that stuff flows east. 
and the Eastern buyers, the Indian housewives, the Chinese housewives, uh, the Eastern Central Banks is in the last year in a quarter, roughly. They are buying all that outflow. So you basically have these, these people who have a short-term memory in the, in the West. They literally have no education about gold. They're gold illiterate mm-hmm. for the most part. I mean, money managers in the aggregate, like less than 1% in, in terms of gold allocated. I mean, just think about that. It's just absolute insanity. We're on the cusp of a mega bull run in gold. And these people are just behind the curve. And not not even, I think they're clueless. I mean, they they don't even know really the basic stuff about gold because they're not taught it. And, and it's it's by design in the West that you're not taught anything about gold. It's to keep you in the Keynesian sphere and this nonsense that the Fiat Central Bank uh, is all wise and all knowing. And it's just, you know, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna find out that's not true. And as confidence falls apart, you're gonna learn about gold. You're gonna have to learn the hard way. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, Part of that, I think part of the problem there is the just the recency bias that things have been working smoothly for so long. And yeah. then we see you know, an issue like the SVB bank come in and kind of remind, let's say, the general public what you know we spend so much time talking about. Yeah, it takes a lifetime to learn some things. And once a lifetime passes and you don't hand that information off to your children in a, in a stern way, it gets forgotten and then just the cycle repeats. So, I mean, here in lolly, lo- lollipop land, United States, where we think, you know, we're the hegemonic power and all's good and well, uh, we've not gone through any crises for a real long time, not any legitimate one, not really since the Great Depression. And you'd have to go behind that, and, you know, to the great panics of the early 20th century to really have anything that was that was totally scary, where, where all of a sudden people were really having to skip meals and stuff like that. That's just not happened just yet. Almost in COVID, it, had, it did. They were quick to react, you know. But um, but yeah, we, we've not gone through true hard times, and 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 so you know, I'm not saying that we are. We may go through true hard times in an acute small segment of time, but I don't think necessarily we're going back to the Stone Age because the banks are collapsing. I mean, they'll come in and rescue it one way or another. The biggest worry is that they let the inflation run, which is what they're going to do. Um, but they're going to try and control that inflation. My concern is, can they control it? You know, they want they want to keep telling you that, uh, yeah, price inflation is uh, six, seven percent. Truth is probably fifteen, roughly, probably almost double. And then, you know, what happens if we have another recession and they they start handing out more currency like they did last time? And and if the value of the, uh, if the, if the if the fiat currency, for instance, we were in more or less the last twelve years, we've been in kind of a secular dollar bull market relative to other other fiat currencies. Well, we're staring at a secular bear market coming. I mean, you know, and then we have this new MCBDC CBDC grid coming in, and the MCBDC thing is like, it's super important. It basically allows all these various major economies to trade and settle with one another without USD intermediary. Mm-hmm. So that what is that for demand? Bearish, extremely bearish, and, and that's coming on in the next five years. Easy. I mean, it could be sooner. So. I think the point of the whole thing is that, yeah, it, it, the fundamentals aren't looking too great. And then, you know, the, the brittleness of the system, I, I, I can totally understand why last month was record sales for us, because people are paying attention and they're increasingly coming in pretty heavy when they, when they go to buy. Mm-hmm. Before we get to the MCBDC thing, I, I've got a couple of questions for you on that. But I wanted to just kind of wrap up what we're seeing in the metals markets first. Are we starting to see some short covering coming into the futures markets? And how are the, let's say, the net longs versus the net shorts starting to balance out? So the mechanics of the comics market, I don't sit there all day and look at that stuff. Uh, I really don't. I mean, I basically, I, I know enough generally in terms of gold, it, the footing of, of the of the shorts versus the longs. It looked real, real recently that really, really sound for you know a raging bull. The silver is still not there yet. What ultimately, ultimately is is the thought process is that at some point when the system's really up against the wall, you're going to have uh, a couple major banks more than likely go long net. And those that are caught short, that can't settle, I mean, they're going to pay through the eye. If you remember, you remember during the 2020 uh, crash of, uh, you know, the, the, the COVID crash, roughly, you, you had a situation where uh, Scotia Makata literally got lit up so hard, they had to close down their entire desk mm-hmm. and, and pay off something like, something tremendous the amount they had to pay off it was multi multi i, I would i don't want to guess and overstate so but it was so much that they had literally shot the shops over like the the parent company's like you guys are done i mean that's how bad they did scotia makata just got wrecked 
And so ultimately, when silver and gold start doing this, what you end up is what's going to happen is it's going to be failures. People who are caught short are going to get ca- going to get caught so short that it's going to be tremendous, and you're going to have people actually fail. I mean, that happened in nineteen in early nineteen eighty. You had Bosch, who, who essentially had to get bailed out. You had in 20, 20, 2008, you had um, uh, Bear Stearns. I mean, basically, it was caught short silver, and they got their heads handed to them. It was part of why they went totally under. Uh, so, so that's essentially what's setting up. And so, you know, whether or not that's happening next week or it's going to happen in a year to two, I would suggest it's the latter. Uh, and I would suggest uh, it's just one of those things where you just kind of want to get positioned ahead of time. And with something that's not for, you know, something that hasn't had, doesn't have time decay, essentially. So that's why bullion is just easy. You know, you, you, stay, you take bullion, you put it in a very safe place, and just wait it out. And, you know, as soon as it performs, then maybe reallocate some of that bullion when it's overperformed versus other asset classes, et cetera. So that's just kind of the way you play it. And in a way, probably have a game plan, you know, have a playbook for, for when that happens of what you're ideally going to rebalance into, right? Yeah, of course. You always need to be, a, there always needs to be a radar for you in terms of, well, A, where's, where, where are you really skilled in terms of asset investments and stuff? Where is, where's your edge? You know, is it local real estate maybe? Well, then maybe you should always keep an eye on what, what's going on in your local real estate market. Maybe have some targets mm-hmm. uh, to potentially acquire, you know, some you know, middle class houses to rent to people, et cetera. So, yeah, I mean, this, that's the concept. It's basically trying to judge, OK, well, what asset class would I be interested in rotating to, say, silver at 75 per ounce or something like that when silver starts really moving? Um, not saying you sell everything at that point, but you definitely should take a little bit of profit, speaking from myself. I mean, I remember in. 2011, you know, silver ran up to the 40s and right near 50. And, um, you know, I thought we were, I, I didn't know the lesson that in a secular commodity bullion bull market, you usually have a 50% retracement at least. And in gold, that was the case. And in silver, you know, we ran well past 50%. So, and I'm sure all your listeners, well, you know, know that the hard way. Uh, but in gold, I mean, right, you went from 1900 back down to 1050, right? And no one would have expected that. You told me that in 2011, I would have been like, oh, you know, because I was young. I didn't, I didn't have any experience. Uh, and so, but the, that's the thing. It's if you're in the casino winning at the casino table, uh, have a right pocket that you're willing to lose and have a left pocket that you're just going to not touch again and just keep mm-hmm. putting gains in that left pocket. That's that's kind of the game. That's the way you play it. Mm-hmm. James, how much industrial demand do we see for gold and, and in what applications does it actually get used? So the industrial demand for gold can can it, it moves a lot. Like when you look at the fundamentals per year, uh, it's roughly just under ten percent, and a lot of it's used for high high end manufacturing in terms of uh, internet backbone, new computers, supercomputers, the guts of things that need to be super super fast and clean in terms of the semiconductors involved. It's also used for high end electronics. I mean, it's because elementally, it's you know gold. It's worthwhile to use in things that are very expensive, uh, mm-hmm. but in thick layerings, right? So, like if you're like a, uh, what's the word? If you're like a one of those hi-fi audio nerds, you know, if you're going to buy like an incredible speaker system, you know, and all that stuff, you know, the cords that you use, they're probably going to be there's probably going to be some gold lacing when you actually plug them in. Like that, there's certain things that gold's used for that that it does better than anything else. And the same with silver, and same with platinum. Uh, I mean, the, these things elementally. Uh, make the most sense. And while they are expensive, if they're done correctly in small amounts, um, they're, they, they're the best at performing. There's no one, nothing else that works that well. So uh, that's essentially why gold is used in manufacturing. I think people don't realize that. I think, again, a lot of people are gold illiterate. They think, oh, gold's just jewelry and adornment and the gold, uh, yeah, the central banks own all the gold. And that's not true. Uh, central banks own like one of four ounces, one of five ounces, depending who you look at. Uh, there's about one in four, one in five ounces in bullion in private homes. And then the rest uh, roughly is sitting around in jewelry piles and stuck inside of your electronics and these computers and cell phones. There's, there's gold in Apple phones. I mean, they got in a lot of trouble because they, they weren't uh, using, they weren't sourcing uh, clean gold in a lot of the high end electronics. So look, it's, it's in a lot of places and people don't understand that. And it's irreplaceable in a lot of ways. So, uh, you know, it's not just simply money or a store of value adornment piece. Mm-hmm. You know, on the other side of that, we've heard about this, let's say, supply to demand shortfall in silver. How long do you see that condition being able to exist with the demand that we're seeing? That's a good question, because you have a, a lot of unsecured ETFs that I believe are 
Uh, you know, they tell you they have so many ounces, but I think the truth is it's a lot less than what they claim. And it's being used as a, as a, as a piggy bank, as a siphoning funnel to tamp out fires as time goes on. So if you actually trust JP Morgan and you think that they're a good trustee and that somebody you should trust, and then you should go buy unsecured SLV and pay 50 basis points per year to underperform versus bullion. And oh, by the way, you don't own anything. You're an unsecured creditor in some slush fund. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's one of the worst things. I mean, I understand if you use that for a short-term trading process, that's fine. You could totally use it for that or for options, et cetera. But people who buy SLV and think they have silver, it's just, I, that's, that's just how illiterate they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and same goes with GLD. So I, I think a lot of those ETFs, we're designed and used basically to siphon a lot of the hot money in and out and to use for tamp down tactics when things get out of control. Uh, you cannot take delivery of SLV or GLD unless you're you know, an approved uh, entity. There's only so many. There's like wow, a couple handfuls of these people and, and they're entities that are large financial entities. And yeah, they could possibly withdraw a bullion out of there. But usually they use that in order to, to tamp down demand and trying to keep the physical demand satiated. And that's that's my point. It's like at some point it will come uh, the overflowing of capital toward this sector and for physical. And I, I, I still believe the silver squeeze leads to the gold squeeze in terms of the bullion market. And there's going to be an acute phase where you literally will look around and there'll be hardly any bullion to get. And whatever you see is going to be extremely priced out. And the delivery times will be so laughably silly. I mean, people are just going to be forced into these under, you know, underperforming derivatives. Like they'll have no other choice. So that's that's kind of the setup that we got. Mm-hmm. You know, I, that that was actually what I wanted to ask you about next. Oh, look, your cat just went out the window again. That's all good. <laughs> for for those that don't have any context, the first time I spoke to James, his cat fell out the window on the actual interview. It was uh, a yeah. rare moment of comedy on the show. Yeah, there was no video. It was just my audio and voice. And like, and you asked me after the interview, you're like, should we keep that in there? I'm like, yeah, that's hilarious. Keep it in there. Yeah, he totally. Yeah, he's fine. The kitty was fine. He landed on soft padding. Like, uh, it was it was one of the funniest moments though, that we've ever had. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely was. We'll put a link to that in the in the show notes <laughs> after. Um, James, uh, I, I wanted to touch on something that you did just mention, and that's the idea of the silver squeeze. You know, that's something obviously that has gotten, you know, tarred a little bit yeah. as of late. But I think that's something that a lot of people still are are counting on and hoping for. So what are your thoughts around that? So silver squeeze, the phenomenon of that is larger than any one person or entity, right? Mm-hmm. It, is a, it is a phenomenon that has roots back all the way to the late 1800s in the United States after they killed silver and, you know, and basically demonetized silver. I mean, this is an echo of that time. And if people don't know their history, they don't understand that silver was demonetized in the 1870s. And essentially, anyone who moved out west, all these different silver uh, mines that were out there, et cetera, et cetera. They, they pretty much got screwed. And the banks that had all the gold could then go out west and pretty much buy up everything for pennies on the dollar. And that, that process took a few decades to play out, but it was a populist process where all of a sudden liberal Democrats were screaming and yelling for silver to be remonetized and turned back to a gold-silver standard. Mm-hmm. And the bankers with all the gold are like, no, we're just going to buy you guys off for pennies on the dollar. You know, you kidding me? You guys are the suckers who went out there and now we're going to come and buy your stuff for nothing. You know, so that's the trick they play. And it happens over and over. This is finance. It's the way it works. And so that's just one echo of it. But today, obviously, it's a little bit of a populist fever to it. Uh, but it's also just a sense of, you know, silver does really perform well. It's, it, you know, it's a place to store value when things are really bad. If the currency starts going wrong, silver will do it. If you look at any any emerging market where the currencies blow out, like Turkey, for instance, Anyone owning silver bullion, there's they're fine. You know the, the value has been stored; it's totally good. Same with gold bullion, same story. Argentina, same story. I mean, you just name any place. Uh, Syria, all these all these terrible you know blowouts of the currencies. Um, Lebanon, yeah. I mean, I'm sure those people are happy if they own physical gold bullion. So you get my point. I mean, it's it's basically like I think people understand the phenomenon of owning physical for the long term as long as they've done their due diligence and their own research and they understand the real reason why they're doing it. And it's not a speculative overnight flip clown show. Okay. This is a long-term game. You're basically trying to become your own central bank by owning sounder monies uh, as an allocation, a portion of your of your wealth, your liquid net your liquid net worth. And so having 20% of your liquid net worth in bullion 
I mean, it's it's a mathematically proven uh, idea. If you back test it throughout the full fiat currency era, having 20, 25 percent of bullion versus, say, the S&P 500 and um, U.S. IOUs, basically U.S. bonds and, and treasury notes, et cetera. Having 20 percent bullion allocation from 1968 until today has been proven to be a good risk reward play between all those, you know, the other two asset classes that I just mentioned. And again, we're talking about your liquid net worth. I mean, I'm not talking about your house that you live in. Take that out of there. I'm not talking about the business you own. No, don't, don't complicate things. I'm just talking about your liquid net worth. That's all. So, James, as, as we're thinking about demand, in one of your most recent weekly update videos on the SD Bullion YouTube channel, you mentioned that there's a much more important development in demand for U.S. dollars than the BRICS de-dollarization. So what does the BIS have up their sleeve for the world payment system as well? So this video that I published on SD Bullion's YouTube channel this past weekend was video from Project Enbridge. It's a video that's done by the Bank for International Settlements. The Bank for International Settlements is the central bank of central banks. Okay, it's, It gets out of Basel, Switzerland. They have a shady, shady uh, history. Uh, the Tower of Basel is probably a book that you might want to read if you don't know who the BIS is. Uh, but the Bank for International Settlements is in charge. They're the ones who are running the show. They, they coordinate. They meet with all the various central banks. They, they conspire to uh, create the next monetary system. And I think that's what they're doing at the moment. Obviously, they're publishing you know, various projects that they're running and, and systems that they're getting ready to launch and foist upon the world. This one is called the MCBDC system. It's essentially the back side of the uh, coming uh, CBDC system where uh, countries can trade and settle trade within one another. And so can major banks. And a lot of these countries where they did the uh, testing, I mean, we're talking about Hong Kong, China, uh, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia. I mean, major countries that are that are going to be coming on with the system and the BIS is there coordinating it all, helping them along the way. And so essentially that's coming. And I, I assume that's coming within the next three, four, five years, that you'll end up having all these various major uh, countries with major GDPs, they'll be able to have the settlement uh, ability in terms of sovereign flows to in, in between major commercial banks too, to settle within their own CBDC currencies. They don't necessarily need to go running over to US dollars or, or you know going to a, a bank that has USD and buying that USD. They can just settle directly between yuan and say ringgits or, or you know what have you. So uh, that's bearish long-term USD demand. And, uh, you know, the, the point is, it's like, look, the, the British uh, sterling uh, currency, you know, it's obviously it lost its, its in 1930, it was still, it, it lost its, its dominant reserve currency status. And the United States more or less took over uh, after World War II and we were in the best position and they were, they were devastated by a lot of the damage from the World War II. So we had this king position of being lucky, you know, where our infrastructure was pretty sound. Nobody touched us, really. I mean, other than over in Hawaii, uh, we had all the gold because we more or less built a huge amount of the stuff that they used for, for armaments. Uh, we just had we had over 20,000 tons of gold at the time. We were a gold powerhouse and our economy was ready to boom because we already built out for all this manufacturing for the war. And so people came back, and started making gizmos and gadgets, et cetera, et cetera. And yada, yada goes history. But. Uh, when you look back at the British pound sterling after it lost its dominant reserve currency status, uh, it's just been up a wall in terms of gold value. And so that's that's essentially what you're going to look at here in the United States. I don't see why that's going to change. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's a big difference between, let's say, central bank level digital currencies and the retail level digital currencies? So there's two ends on each side, right? There's a retail currency that's traded on the CBDC, but on the back end underneath in the, in the monetary system, there needs to be a settlement of accounts. Uh, between the major players. And so you have flows like MCBDC will never be used by anyone in the retail market, but it's a way for the major major institutions to settle trades, right? Uh, whereas the CBDC floats on the retail top, essentially. And so, you know, say, for instance, the Fiat Fed is like, uh, hey, uh, we're going to give you uh, every month a certain allocation of currency because uh, artificial intelligence is taking all your jobs. And uh, so now you're going to get a stipend every month and it's going to be the United States stipend, something like that. They'll call it something cool, right? And, and then on your phone, you'll download the smartphone and then every month you'll get X amount of CBDC to your phone. And, you know, I, I suppose they'll, they'll probably put parameters on what you can use it for. But the bottom line is that's coming, I think. Uh, you know, there's going to be a CBD. I know there's a lot of people out there who don't like that. And I know that people are angry about it and this and they're just saying no to CBDC. No, they're going to get it 
one way or another, it will come. That's just the way it works because, you know, you're a small minority and the amount of people out there who just don't care uh, outweigh you far, far and away. And so or, or it's, don't even know, right? right. Don't even know but, what the consequence might be. Totally. And so it's, so it's going to come one way or another. Our Congress, our senators, they get bought off for next to nothing. And so it, it's coming no matter what you, no matter how big of a fit you throw. So I would just, I would just plan for it and, and get ready for it. And so, yeah, it's going to become, and there's two different systems. When you go into the BIS YouTube channel, I would suggest you could do some research or you can go on their website and do research, but the, you know, search terms in CBDC all in a row or CBDC project in bridge. Uh, you can do your own reading of it. I mean, what I take from it is it's coming and it's going to be system wide and large. And it's going to be emergent. And it's not just merely five countries that have been in the test program. It's going to be 50, 100 of the major GDPs in the world in the next four or five years. James, is there, do you think that there's a, a meaningful or important way that they start to shoehorn people into that system or oh, force that? It'll, it'll how, be, how do we get that? Oh, you get there by having a failing banking system. That's how you get there. You get there by having people so scared that the only one, the only bank they want to keep it with is the treasury itself, right? Mm -hmm. So you scare the absolute crap out of them by having a banking crisis. That's, you know, out of crisis, out of the chaos comes the next order. That's essentially what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So the sequence has started. It's not happening tomorrow. But if you remember back to 2008, for instance, right? I mean, how'd it go, right? It, it went like... Uh, Bear Stearns collapsed, and then, oh, summer was pretty cool, nothing really too crazy. A couple of things here and there, but then all of a sudden comes September, holy chaos, right? And so it's going to be similar to that, probably something along those lines. Uh, I don't know exactly what's going to be the actual thing that kicks it off that makes it really go crazy, but it's a brittle system. And so therefore, it's a brittle system, if one thing kind of breaks off and sets off one way, all of a sudden it could topple over very quickly. And so... Uh, for me, I personally will, you know, obviously bullion allocation makes a lot of sense. Having fiscal cash in your house or somewhere that you can get outside of the banking system uh, makes a lot of sense, at least enough to cover, say, three, four, five months of expenses. I mean, unless you want to go sit in ATM lines, search around, you know, I mean, if, if, if the Internet or the banking system gets hacked or something like that, that's what I'm talking about. It's the fact that all digital payments can't get through for months. What are you doing? Cash is king. Cash wins. It's like, look back at Puerto Rico when they had the hurricane. What was the thing that was used? Cash. If you didn't have cash, you were kind of screwed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got to plan for a few different ideas of what can come. But yeah, I, I think the system, we're going to go through a big change in the next few years and it's going to be tumultuous. It's going to be probably the second half of the, you know, of the 2008 GFC that we essentially papered over. And in that crisis, out of that chaos, will come the next order and of course, it'll be CBDC and all the stuff they're planning for us. James, one idea that you touched on in a recent Twitter spaces that you joined with us was the idea of fraud within the industry. So, so how do you think about keeping your investment safe going forward? And what have you learned from past cases like, let's say, Monex? Okay. Um, this is a long subject. I could <laughs> talk for hours on this uh, because so much of this stuff. I mean, to be quite honest and sincere about it, it pisses me off that, mm -hmm. that there is bad actors in our industry and space that take advantage of people who are naive. There's tons of them, right? And these, these old, terrible retail practices that happened from the 80s bear market that have been handed down to these, I don't know, there's probably like 500 of these dealers in the United States. And you hear them on your, you know, AM, your AM, you know, conservative talk radio. It's like, buy gold. And it's like this washed up, like, you know, actor who's like, oh, uh, uh, buy the gold. It's like, A, it's ridiculous that these people are poor, so poor that they have to actually get bought out by these companies to be the spokesperson. And they're selling and literally, they, I don't know if they know or not, but, but literally they're just basically allowing these companies to go out and just straight up pilfer their retirement funds, straight up pilfer whatever money they have on the way out of, you know, in terms of their old age. So it's real ugly, real bad. Um, so the key with it is, is to be safe is simply stick with bullion physically. If you're going to buy it, you can buy it. You know, sometimes if you're in a late major city, you go to a local coin shop, et cetera, uh, you know, pay cash on the barrel, uh, that, or pay by bank wire, as long as it's a trustee, not fly by night op uh, in terms of local coin shops. Uh, you can buy online from us, for instance, or any of the high volume bullion dealers that are reputable, um, you know, there's there's a whole bunch of things, but you need you need a transparent pricing. 
you need to know what over spot you're paying. Okay, what product are you gonna get? How much would you buy this product for? I need to know that price. Is it published somewhere? Or is, am I just, you know, what are you gonna offer if I walk in? Or pretend, just walk into a place and be like, yeah, I have a gold eagle I wanna sell you. What are you offering? Mm -hmm. Or call them, you can just call them and find out, you know? So yeah, there's ways, but just stick with bullion, stick with stuff that's simple and just keep your mouth shut. Don't, don't talk a lot about it, you know, because it's probably gonna be in your home for many people. Uh, if you get too large of a size, you're very concerned about maybe, you know, there being a home invasion or someone robbing your house, you should then start to think about, well, uh, there's, there's, there's various logistics companies and service providers that will, you know, that will totally look over bullion. I mean, there's Brinks, there's, there's G4S, there's Loomis, there's Malka Amit. I mean, there's all these companies that do this professionally and they're not in the banking system. They're not back there trading derivatives. They're not front running you. Uh, you know, these are just regular people who look after the bullion sitting in a, in a depository, a bonded depository. So those are some ideas, some options. I mean, SD Bullion offers storage. I trust Tyler Wall. I keep some of my metal with, with, with Tyler over in uh, Southeast Michigan. So uh, there's various options in various places. Maybe not stick all your eggs in one basket. You know, that would be my suggestion too. find counterparties that you know you can trust that are legit, that are proven, that are reputable, that are doing it for a long time. They're not incompetent they're not uh, people who've been fly, you know who just kind of johnny come lately types you need people who are reputable who have good track records who are you know other people have worked with and dealt with that are that are real that are that are legit people who have who have good character that's the key it's trying to find other counterparties that have legit character that are doing it for the right reasons mm -hmm. you know james you've, you've also written about cryptocurrencies in some of the same fraudulent contexts do you think that there's more issues within the crypto market and perhaps even the stablecoin market that could yet be proven to be fraudulent? Totally. I think high 90 percentile of those cryptos are going to zero and going away. Uh, and, you know, there's going to be a lot more fraud that comes out that will be exposed as time's going on. What's happening is that the BIS, you know, as they start to launch their programs, they want to totally discredit the hell out of everything crypto everything Bitcoin, they just want to do whatever, they're going to do a, a number on them. And they already are, slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. um, but in the end, um, there's a few cryptos out there that have some technology that's probably going to be applicable that, that will be used for different things. Don't get me wrong. But the high 90 percentile are going to zero. And you're going to find out that a high 90 percentile are frauds. Mm -hmm. And do you think that the... You know, we've we've heard a lot about the blockchain combining with the precious metals. That that has a lot of possibility. Do you see any application for that? I don't, because in the sense that uh, I can understand the use case for somebody who lives in a country where there's ridiculous taxes on having physical bullion in your hand. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you live in the EU, you got to pay sometimes twenty percent VAT on silver bullion. Well, maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you just simply want to have bullion in another place offshore, for instance in a segregated vault and there's your silver position. You didn't have to pay the BAT. And whenever you want to sell some, you can just sell some from that segregated vault. Um, there are options like that that exist. But I think when you introduce these types of plans where you have a card and, and you know you, you can go and buy coffee with say your gold or silver, there's a couple of things. A, what are you doing? Gresham's law is spend the fiat script first and save the precious metals for the long haul, right? So that's A. And then B, it's it's the other question is, well, the complexity involved with the settlement of that when you actually go into the mechanics of some of these companies, dubious, some of them. I, some of them are going to fail, I think, when it's all said and done. And some of them, I just personally wouldn't wouldn't dare keep too much in any of these. For instance, I, I, just, I just wouldn't put more than, say, a couple single digit percent, you know, really, really small, minute amount. I would not, I would not have like say 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of my physical precious metals holdings in any of those companies because to me, the complexity, it, it, it just doesn't make sense in terms of a business case. You know, the bullion is for saving for the long haul. If you go to sell it off, do it the old manual way, I think it's probably the smarter move than simply sliding in, you know, a debit card and, and spinning it that way. I just per personally, that's the way I've gone. So. Mm -hmm. You know, James, you're, you're constantly analyzing data from the precious metals and, and currencies markets. Are there any of your findings that have truly surprised you over the years? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Every day. Every day there's something something like where you just do a double take and just, what? Um, I mean, I I don't know. I mean, it, some of it's like, some of it's so... Some of it's so nerdy and kind of nuanced and, and most of your people will be like, so what? 
Uh, but I, I've gone so deep into this rabbit hole that some of it is profound. Uh, but I maybe have a shortcoming in my ability to communicate it or to uh, to transfer it into your brain, right? If I can simply just take what I got here and just shove it in your head uh, real quickly, uh, then maybe you'd be, a, you know, you'd feel the same way. Um, but there's every day there's something. That's kind of why I really like this, uh, what I'm doing in terms of uh, work, because it's so mentally stimulating, essentially. It's, it's definitely stimulating to stay on top of what's happening and it's, change is happening so rapidly. I mean, it's a full-time job just to know what's going on in the market, to have any view or any analysis of it. It's, it's, a, it's a full-time job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and of course, you publish a lot of excellent charts on your Twitter feed, and and your your weekly videos as well. It's it's a sure. it's a it's a great wealth of information for anybody that you know needs your, a digestible little piece to to be able to yeah. keep up on on things. Yeah, if you're if you're a left brain analytical person and you like charts and graphs and stuff, then my Twitter handle is pretty good for that. Um, and then as well on the video side, there's a little bit of right brain creativity in the editing and the flow of the, the content. Uh, but it's very left brain heavy too, because we do a lot of data diving. And so sometimes you might need to press pause, blow up your screen, you know, use a desktop better than a phone, mm-hmm. that type of stuff. Um, you know, so, but yeah, it, it, it's, it, I try and make videos on the YouTube channel for SD boy and that are short. I have respect for people's time, you know, nothing more than 10 to 15, 20 minutes tops. And, and that are cutting to the, to the leading edge of what's going on, which you really need to know the stuff that I'm doing on your behalf. I'm trying to aggregate the stuff that actually makes the most sense that you really need to know, because I personally, you know, I'm, I'm invested in silver and gold and bullion and uh, heavily so, probably irresponsibly so. But uh, I, I need to stay on the leading edge because, uh, you know, it's for my benefit, too. And so we just try and pass that along as a, as a complimentary service to people who follow our YouTube channel. And of course... That Twitter handle is at James Henry A N D. Um, mm-hmm. James, you know you're off to Istanbul, Turkey this summer, and we'll be documenting your trip for your followers. What is the significance to you of Turkey, and can we all learn some lessons from it as a case study, as you mentioned earlier, as they've been experiencing some severe currency devaluation? All right. So Turkey in 2007, 2008, during the last commodity secular bull. When China was out there buying all all the commodities, and prices of commodities were jacking up by early 2008. Turkey got to the point where it was almost one to one at parity with the U.S. dollar, okay, with the fiat USD, and so you had a one to one almost, an even parity, close. They came close, and then by the time I went there the first time through Istanbul, it was a couple of years ago, summer 2021, I believe, uh, and their currency had already blown out to 8.5, 8.7, something like that. So from one to 8.5, you know, how's that over how long? Uh, what was that? Uh, 12, 13 years. Yeah, I don't think people would be pre- pretty happy if that happened uh, to our currency. Right. Uh, but the good thing about Istanbul is it's a major metropolitan and you have currencies from all over the world. And so at least people have the ability to access euros or to access uh, Swiss franc or to access USD somehow, some way. If you don't, you're kind of screwed. You know, if you're getting paid in local currency, good luck keeping up. Um, and so that's the situation when I went through in 2021 and you could see this all the time. I see it here in Panama too. The service class are the people who had to run from their own countries. Like for instance, here in Panama, a lot of service class is Venezuela, hardworking people, usually really, really good people, but they literally had to leave their country because they needed to make currency to send back home to their parents who can't work. Right. Same story there. I mean, you have Syrian refugees people from Lebanon who run to Istanbul and who are working in the service sector. And you grab one of those people and you talk to them about their experience. And you tell me if that's not profound. Uh, that's important to, 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 to actually, to empathize, to understand, to try and get a feel for, hey, I know that you have these USD green dollar glasses on. Now take those off for a minute, okay? Go talk to this person and actually think, what would that be like for you? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the idea. And so, yeah, Turkey, <laughs> is a major sector. Uh, it's growing in terms of uh, refinement power in gold and in silver, especially. They've become a big player in terms of making uh, retail silver bars in the last few years, pretty much ever since COVID-2020. They've really gained in market share. Uh, you look at a chart of the amount of silver that's going in their, into their country, it's just going straight up. So they're, they're growing a lot of that in terms of market share. And I last time I was there, there was a, a local holiday and it was kind of during the COVID pandemic. So uh, it was a little bit sketch to kind of run through Istanbul at the time, but this time it should be a lot safer and I'll, I'll make sure not to go there on a holiday so I can actually walk into the Grand Bazaar and see that spectacle 
I am certain that it's going to be something worthwhile documenting. And I'll try and bring some of that home uh, in terms of uh, putting it up on the SD Boy YouTube channel and, and showing people a little bit of the other side of the world and how people are doing the trade. Mm -hmm. Excellent, James. Well, we look forward to that and hearing more from you in the future. Is there anything else you'd like to touch on before we wrap up today? No, I think that's it. I, you know, things are looking very, very strong in terms of uh, gold and silver uh, moving forward. Fundamentally sounds, and then technically, when you look at the price charts, looking good. I mean, again, if you have a bank failure scenario where it goes totally deflationary, sure, you could have spot price sell-offs. What you're in, what you'll end up seeing in that case is fully and gold unfindable, essentially. People are going to start running out and you'll see a situation like we saw during COVID where it's just a huge gap between what the spot claims and what people are selling, whatever little bullion they got. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, so don't go all, all in at once, dollar cost average, kind of kind of go smooth uh, into a position that you want to want to, want to make. And then, uh, yeah, just follow my work at SD Bullion's YouTube channel. And uh, thanks for having me on, Tom. Of course, James. It was a pleasure to chat again and look forward to doing it again. Thank you. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.